Thank you for tuning in for our conversation with Joe Caruso. My name is Michael and I am your producer today. Our guest today will be Lee Weinrob. Hello Lee, how are you doing today? How are you? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate that. I know Joe Caruso will be interviewing you. He'll be joining us shortly, but I wanted to come on first and get a little of your background so the audience knows who you are and what you've accomplished so far, because I'm impressed. I can tell you 100%. We've met a few few months ago and, oh, Joe, how are you doing, sir? Hi, how are you? Excellent. Well, I am going to actually let Lee give her background and then I'm going to jump off and thank you, Joe, very much. Glad to be here. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Joe. Hey, it's nice to see your smiling face again. Like you know what? what? Oh, now it just went to a, some kind of a symbol. I'm not sure exactly why I can't see you now, but um, technology as it is. It is, a, is it a symbol that? Ah, there you <laughs> are. <laughs> it's, it wasn't a symbol that was worthy of your face. So, <laughs> so tell us about you. Where do I even begin? Tell us about me. Um, you so, were born uh, uh, roughly at, at birth. <laughs> That's what they say. Although I feel like I probably lived previous lives. I've always been an old soul, but born in New York got a mom from Brooklyn. I've got a dad from Queens. Somehow I've lost the, those accents. I uh, grew up four years old. My parents put a tennis racket in my hand and I fell madly in love with the smell of a tennis ball and the sound of a tennis ball and the feeling of smashing a tennis ball. And then pretty much became a very competitive little kid, athlete, tennis player. Um, ended up by about 13, 14, becoming more and more competitive and realizing that I would get very emotional on a tennis court, which was the beginning of my fascination with sports psychology. I worked with sports performance coaches, sports psychologists. It was always sort of in the back of my mind that I was very interested in learning how to understand human motivation and how to regulate some of my own emotions and not behave quite like John McEnroe. Um, and learning how to sort of master my mind to optimize my performance. And then played college tennis at Northwestern, which was amazing. And shortly thereafter, didn't want to get a, a, a real job working in an office, sitting at a desk, uh, kind of resisted that. And my, my dream to win Wimbledon didn't happen. So I went through sort of a phase of like, who am I and what do I want to be? And ended up coaching tennis at Dartmouth which I loved, thus furthering my fascination with like, why can one athlete perform under pressure and another one can't? Um, and even though all these athletes have incredible physical gifts, what separated them was more, you know, the mastery of the mind. Ended up going back to Northwestern, coaching more, five years of tennis at Northwestern, and then inevitably went to grad school to study traditional psychology, psycho, psychoanalytic, psychodynamic theory, a lot of Freud, a lot of Jung, I got an amazing education in grad school. And then kind of fell into the, okay, I need an office and I'm gonna get this beautiful office with a beautiful couch and some you know, powerful therapeutic chairs and realized that I didn't really love sitting in an office with my client. So that was the beginning of suggesting to a client, let's, let's get out of here, let's go take a walk. Even though I lived in Chicago and it was all of 10 degrees at the time, and that kind of birthed the next piece of my professional and personal identity, which was I began to love this walk and talk. And I started this company, Mind in Motion. And then Mind in Motion just continued to, to birth other concepts that all are driven from probably my core passion, which is to get people to look inside of themselves for the answers that exist within. And now today, I spend many hours a day walking and talking with clients all over the world. I give talks that are all about sort of introspection and then when I help people look within, they're then compelled to take action. And I have a clothing company and I do speaking and that's, that's my story in a nutshell. There's so many other layers to that, but for purposes of time, that's, that gives you a gist of 
why I do what I do and the passion I do it with. I think that was a brilliant uh, overview. Thank you very much. I uh, feel like I know you now, even though we've only talked once prior to this. Um, what going on there? You've got you know, the peripatetic school of Lee. Uh, peripatetic being the uh, ancient Greek uh, philosophy class. They would walk and talk. Um, brilliant. The fact that there has to be motion, that the body and the mind are connected that sometimes the desire to win can drive aggression. And aggression is the root of anger because it's driven by the fear of losing. All anger is driven by fear. Fear of failure, fear of losing. So there's a lot of psychoanalytical ideas in, and philosophical uh, ideas that you've discovered along the way. You know. I, I'm known for saying that we enter each age of life as a novice. I just got done talking two days ago to the military, a bunch of warriors, and uh, in some many bases around the world, satellite. And I was talking to them about the importance of reflection, which is a fairly new idea <laughs> there in that, in that particular uh, group. And I was saying, I wake up every morning and instead of turning on my electronics and checking what's happening, what did I miss? It, it, I, I get a lot of news uh, aggregates and they say, what you missed and need to know. I don't even open those. I don't care about what I missed. I don't miss a lot. And I don't need to be told what I missed. What I wanna know is I'm smarter than I was yesterday by one day's wisdom, one day's experience. What am I doing I shouldn't be doing? What am I doing that's not helping me? Before I look at a checklist of things I need to do today based on deadline, before I'm a doer doing, I wanna be a thinker thinking. Why am I even playing this game? What is the game? How am I defining the game? Or am I not defining the game? Are the rules as they're stated true? Or are some of them my mother's or father's rules from the past that don't apply to me anymore in this new age of life as a novice that I'm entering? And you help people do these kind of considerations. So when you uh, who have reinvented yourself several times, when you get to a state where it's time to consider a new idea, how do you enter that state? First of all, I, I love the idea. I want to be a thinker thinking, and it made me think about, I want to be a, a feeler feeling the feels to get the, the deepest sense of wisdom. It's a, it's a great question. And if I look back and I, I've made all these sort of shifts in my life, um, sort of recreated or, or, or move my professional energy in a different direction, what was the process by which I did that? Um, I think it kind of goes back to what you were talking to, to uh, the, the soldiers about, which is I spend quite a bit of time going outside in nature because that's when my thinking cap is on the clearest, doing my own reflection and identifying what's, what's missing in my life. Where do I feel stuck? What what is going to you know, reinvigorate my life? What's, what's exciting for me? But I do a whole bunch of my own thinking and reflection. And then I tend to be a very relational person where I process more in an interpersonal dynamic. Um, and I'll probably find my own coach or therapist or a mentor or a, a, a wise peer to have some deep conversation about testing some different ideas. I would say if I look back at all of the different pivots I've made or sort of growth points and milestones in my career, it's come down to taking the time to pause to become aware of what's actually going on inside of me and then kind of testing it out with people that I really respect who I know are gonna push me. 
and ask me questions that I may not have explored myself. And then I guess I go for it. I go, I go all in. Um, in, 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 uh, in psychoanalysis is called the talking cure. But when you have someone who's objective, meaning they don't want to advise you about, you know what you should do. Anybody says that, run the other way. If someone says, you know what you're really good at? You know what your essence is? You know what I admire about you? Those are people that are talking about you now. And those are people that can help. I talk to my clients an hour a week, every week. There is no syllabus about whatever's on their mind to hear how they're processing their life to help them get that reflection. I'm kind of like the mirror. It's not just personal reflection. And it's very, very important to have those people in your life. One of the reasons we did conversations with Joe is so people can hear these kind of conversations. Uh, Perspective is, is critical. Um, as a writer, I can say that if I write something, I need to get away from it, then come back and read it. Um, so I have that reflection, that time away, and then I can look at it again. I'm not in it. I'm not a doer immersed in doing. Be, you, know, you know, in tennis, you can get them to chase the ball that's not the game ball. And in negotiation, when I negotiate, I try to create all kinds of balls in the air so they get distracted from the game ball. And in, in life, our problems as we travel down the, the road of life, our problems jump up and down on the side of the road and jump in front of us and scream and yell and try to get our attention. And some of the things we should look at just sit there quietly waiting to be noticed. And without that time for reflection and introspection, and without that person to talk to, as you talked about earlier, and as I do for a living, um, it's hard to gain that insight because we're always looking out. Very rarely like to look in. God, is that scary territory. We're <laughs> territory. We really don't want to look there. Who knows what the hell we'll see. I want to um, introduce a concept to you and see what your thoughts are. Is that okay? okay. As one who, before COVID, traveled two thirds of the year, often for pleasure, sorry, often for pleasure, um, but also for work. And I tied them together. I remember in college, I read a poet that said, uh, happiness, I'm paraphrasing terribly, uh, can occur when your avocation and your vocation are one as your two eyes are one in sight. And I made a decision that that's it. Why work and then have time off and then work and then have time off. And so I decided to make my passion my life. But I realized with all the travel, Lee, that I was losing the concept of home. So I travel with my wife, we'd go for seven weeks or six weeks to Italy or whatever. I'm very fortunate I can do these things. Um, my parents would not understand. And you gotta be able to be home all the time. So what is home? And I started breaking it down. Home is reading for me, reading, learning exchanging idea with others, not just event or happenings, cooking, music, love. Kind of knowing where my stuff is a little bit, not having it in a suitcase. <laughs> to me, these ideas became the elements of home. 
And sometimes when the world is swirling around us, we don't know how to find home. So we hold on to our fears and insecurities or anything else that diverts us from it. Or we're like this, a goggle at it. And we're left out of both of those processes, our growth, our experience, our potential, but not, not our experience, our potential. It, it, it's exclusive from being home in your mind. How do you center around home? So it's a really interesting question. I think right now it's incredibly relevant in that you know, for the last year, unfortunately now we're pulling out of it, but we've all been in our homes, but we have not necessarily felt like we've dropped into center in these homes. <laughs> Um, but, but as you were thinking about that and you were describing like the types of experiences that make you access that feeling of like inner peace or home, what came up for me, the, the first word is like, like being centered. And I always refer to sports because my brain and my heart naturally just kind of think in sports mentality. And it was, we're, we're, all, we're all, we're all guilty of our training. <laughs> yes, we are. We are conditioned. And I'm conditioned to think like a tennis player where, you know, no matter what day of the week it is that you're practicing or no matter what competition you're about to go, uh, you know, step on the court and experience, you must have skill set on how to get yourself centered. And the, the next thought I was having about like, how do you get into that centered place? You don't arbitrarily do it. There are actual rituals that you obsessive compulsively study and grab hold of that become these non-negotiable fundamental practices that make you drop this centered place. And the idea of, I, similarly to you, I've combined my work with, my, my work is my passion, I get to do similar things. Um, I, I feel like I will lose that sense of being centered and grounded and have inner peace if I don't have the rituals that anger me, whether it's you know, the, the mug that I use for my coffee. Wait, you said anchor, not anger. Anchor. Anchor. Okay, thanks. I miss her. I get anger if they get unanchored. <laughs> yes, you do. That's part of your obsessive, you're not obsessive compulsive, that's different, but, but we can be obsessive about wanting to be a doer doing completing and feeling a sense of accomplishment. And if something sidetracks that, that can be disturbing to a personality like yours. Now, I don't know you that well, but I'm pretty good at this. I guess it really I'm more like my dad than I thought, as I, as I heard you just reflect that back to me. Um, <laughs> no doubt, in order for me to create the sensation of home, which to me is an, is an inner experience. You could plop me in a variety of different places in a hotel room with a suitcase, but I have got to do certain things, take, take the time and practice just very nuanced rituals to get myself into feeling centered or calm, uh, organized, clear, uh, even sort of elated, or you know, you said love for me, like love, love is what makes me feel like I'm home, kind of being nurtured, like meals, food, family, connection. And if I'm not, if I'm not paying attention to those things and practicing those things, I'm not gonna feel grounded. I'm not gonna feel the sensation of being home in my own body. Um, Brilliant answer. Uh, busy is not a badge of honor. For some reason, in this country we get confused about about that. But if I might call you Dorothy, there is no place like home. <laughs> and 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 when we have that in our minds and in our hearts, our nervous system biologically goes into a parasympathetic state, which means our heart beats naturally. We breathe. Our oxygen flows to our brain from our heart. We can think more clearly. A sympathetic
sympathetic state would be a state of panic. And your body responds to that differently. Your, your amygdala in the, in the uh, primitive part of your mind takes over. Your right frontal cerebral cortex, which does all the thinking and logic, just wants to justify why you feel fear or anger. And you feel fear before you feel anger. Every time if you've got an anger issue, ask yourself what you were afraid of right before you got mad. And that will be the key to how to deal with your anger issue. When they talk about dealing with anger issues, I don't, I, I help people with anger by helping them with their fear. When they can understand the correlation, then we can get them before they redline. Once you redline, you're done. So I, I was, it was Freudian in my hearing that I heard you say anger instead of anger issues instead of anchor. Um, in that the one can have you operate out of a parasympathetic system, nervous system, love, kindness, nature. I'm okay. The world's okay. I don't need to react. I can respond. Lao Tzu, 604 BC. And it's critical without that sense of home, if you're just spinning, reacting, a doer doing, but, well, let me put it this way. I'll use some terms you might understand. You ever see young kids play soccer? They all just chase the ball. All right, now you've helped, you've, I'm sure in your life because of the way you love to teach, you love developing people. It's part of who you are. You love to uh, share your expertise, if I could say that, which is a lovely thing to do. I mean, that's what the world's about. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to advance in thought as we have. Uh, not emotion, but in thought. And a young tennis player will chase the ball on a great tennis player who would try to get the opponent to chase the ball. Would you agree with that? To some degree, I would agree with that. <laughs> okay. Now I'm, I'm out of my team. Uh, I'm certainly not a, a, a fine tennis player, but let me put it this way. When you have your chops down, if I'm a, I'm a musician, so we call it chops. You, you, you know how to do what you're doing, right? You don't go, are you right-handed? Yes, I am. Okay. So you have to go backcourt left hand mm -hmm. to your left side. You don't think about turning that racket a quarter of a turn while you're running. Mm -hmm. That's already in you. Yeah. You've got that down. You've got that down. Many people don't know how to have the simplest things handled. In, and under their belt, as they say, um, so they can handle the bigger things. So that every little thing is an exasperational moment. And knowing how to find your center, your home, knowing that you have the skills, knowing that you have survived everything life has thrown at you, no matter how difficult, you're here, okay. And knowing that and getting back to that can help you face the uncertainty and all the fear uncertainty brings in the next day. Beyond that, if you really master it, it helps you find out who you can be. I can stop kind of clothing. I can, I cannot just be a philosopher, therapist, like I study and admire you. I can help people understand that their heart beats while their mind thinks and one affects the other. While their neuromuscular system, a neuromuscular skeletal system 
he's operating. And you were able to think of that instead of the model that you had in modeling something, you created something. And there's a tremendous sense of pride, belonging, humanness, mattering that comes with that. My goal is to help everybody discover that personally for themselves. I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've been nattering on here. Um, I need to go back to the producer probably and uh, I'm looking at the time. Time flies with you. I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed talking to you. I, I, I wanna share with you and I wanna learn from you. Oh, uh, well, well, just anytime, you call me anytime. I, I'm committed to helping, um, developing myself first and then helping others. So I have to ask if there are questions we have from uh, those that are uh, being put through this process. There is a question regarding the mindset of athletes and what it takes at the different levels and how uh, you could approach that from the high school to the college to the professional level and what it takes is a different mindset to see as a coach versus a player from your perspective? I love that question. Lee, over to you. Uh, certainly there's differing levels of training one an athlete would need to have depending on you know how skilled they are or competitive they are in, in, in the sport that they're in. Uh, I would say first and foremost, to what degree can this athlete make a commitment to do the mental training? It's not so much that the mindset at different levels is different. It's learning how to regulate your breathing. It's learning how to recognize that your brain is ruminating, whether it's about an error from the past or, or a concern about the future or focus on the outcome. Teaching an athlete how to have the mindset of being in the present moment, how to drop the, the upset of a former mistake. Um, teaching an athlete how to have vision or visualization, the skills that I would train uh, a middle schooler playing soccer or a high schooler who's, you know, a, like becoming a varsity athlete or a college player or a professional player, the skill sets are actually quite simple and similar. The degree to which they're willing to practice it, uh, train it, and, and kind of set a different level bar varies. But I think that the, the mindset of a champion and the training of a, of a champion's brain is all pretty darn similar. Um, and tell me again the specific question about coach to, what was the last question? How does the mindset change from being a coach from being a player? A great question. Um, I think probably because I've done both. Um, for, for one, I would say that I learned when I went into coaching that a great coach takes none of the credit and all of the blame. So a huge sense of responsibility for really kind of nurturing that athlete and supporting that athlete. I think if I go back to my own life, having been a player and the kinds of pressure I, I would put on myself and a lot of the, the internalized doubt I was having, I, I, I had a hard time seeing the strengths or the gifts or the process because I would get lost in my own emotion. The, the role of the coach and the mindset of the coach is one probably of more unconditional support and positive regard, um, reminders of strengths. Um, can I project right there? Because I know we're out of time. Brilliant answer. Brilliant question, whoever sent that in. And when we go from, say, being a person to being a parent, it's the same thing. You can't take the performance of the other person or you'll get angry at them. And then you're not helping anymore. You're not doing all the things you just mentioned. So it happens in life as well. It's a great metaphor. I want to I thank you, Leah. You're just such a pleasure to talk to. I can see why you're so successful. Now, one more thing. There, there's, sure. a, there's a soccer league in my town where I live, and I saw a t-shirt 
that one of the people on the sidelines was wearing in the back of the t-shirt, it said, the players play, the coaches coach, the parents cheer, which I love. <laughs> so um, so I'll, I'll end with that idea that the player has to be in the moment, the coach has to support and, and, and like guide and, and the parent or the support are in the, they're, they're in the sidelines or in the corner saying, you got this. Um, so, anyway. sometimes, sometimes we have to be all three for ourselves. That's really brilliant. I love it. And uh, you're the best. I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Why don't you give me a call in a little bit, uh, whenever you want, and, and let's follow up. If you want, you had some questions and you want to talk, I'd love to talk some more. You're very interesting. Thank thanks. You. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, watchers. And coming up soon, we got David DeFranco on June 15th at 2 o'clock. We got James Reed, June 30th at 3 o'clock. Both are going to be great. Thank you, Lee. Take care. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Tune in next time for a conversation with Joe Caruso.